Hi, I'm James. Uh, I'm from London. Um, I do a range of things. Well, first of all, I should just say thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you in particular, Peter, for the organisation he's done. Also to uh, the Archive and to uh, the Mullen Foundation who made it possible for me to be here. Um, the title of this talk was Books as Data, uh, which kind of meant lots and lots of different things when I first said it. So I'm going to kind of run through... I'm not really going to give the thing that I originally talked about. Um, I never really do, sorry about that. But th this, the idea of books as data will sort of underlie what I'm going to say, I think, in, in several different <laughs> ways. And I'll try and kind of pull that out. It originally meant things like the way in which Google reads books, or the way that Amazon acts on book information. Um, and I think it's a really interesting subject that I'm not going to get too much into to today, though I say it will come out at various times. Um, what you will get, though, is um, uh, I think you'll get a lot of that in some of the other talks that are coming after mine. We had a bit about this morning, and it's a really interesting area. Um, there's been a... We get this at every conference. Uh, we keep going over the same sort of ground of what is the book, what does it mean now, what, how do all these different definitions of it that we're kind of talking about come together. Um, and it's kind of really boring, but we have to do it every time. Uh, and so I wanted to state kind of outright at the start that when I talk about books, um, I'm not talking about specifically bound books, and I'm not specifically talking about e-books either. I'm not talking about the containers, really. Um, specifically in this case, I'm, I'm going to talk about, when I say it, I usually mean long-form texts. I mean, because basically that's what I'm interested in. Um, and I talk about what I'm interested in in terms of my own interest in it. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's odd that we have these words that kind of travel. When people talk about music, uh, they don't feel the need to qualify whether they're talking about MP3s or vinyls, but we always feel the need that there's some kind of important differences in these types of books that we're talking about. And there are in some ways, but there's also a kind of continuum, and it's on that continuum that I want to kind of talk through. Um, and so if we understand the books as a kind of continuum, uh, not, as was mentioned yesterday, as spaceships, but as, as the journey itself, um, as what kind of everything that happens to us as literature passes through us, um, then we can also understand digital as something that kind of acts on that continuum of the book rather than being something that fundamentally changes it. Um, I go through periods of, of this stuff, obviously. Um, I've worked on all kinds of things, and it's worth qualifying that I do do very practical things, even if I'm going to talk a lot of crazy stuff today. Uh, but you can see those things on the web. You can go to my website, and you see the sort of people I work with, see the projects. I want to talk more about some of the ideas behind them and how they come about. Um, so, so I've gone through all these kind of ups and downs on feelings, different things about this. Um, but I'm in a very conservative position right now, essentially. Um, worked on some enhanced projects, seen a lot of other ones come out, and I kind of want to return to the text itself and talk about that and why I think it's important. I've become very suspicious of enhancements to the text itself um, for, for a huge number of reasons. But, I mean, to take a, a couple of examples, we've, we've had kind of 20 years of multimedia now, which is an awful term, but we kind of know what it means, and we know how it applies, and we've tried it a number of times with CD-ROMs and various other formats uh, to kind of munge these different types of media together as though it somehow makes them better. Um, and it kind of doesn't, really, uh, in most cases. Uh, there's sometimes it works, but if you ever tried to watch a video tutorial online, you'll know that when text serves better than video. Uh, illustrated books have a huge purpose, but adding needless illustration doesn't help. Um, adding Extraneous information often obliterates well-thought text. Uh, I can get into all kinds of trouble making this argument, but I, I'm prepared to make it quite heavily. And I also make it for things like uh, interactive text. Um, books have always been interactive. The process of reading is interactive in and of itself. Um, we create in our mind the kind of images that writers are kind of trying to transmit to us. Um, and there have been... We continually see people trying to make narrative experiments uh, online and elsewhere. And they've been doing this for, you can go back 20 years again and see the first kind of hypertext fictions um, and interactive fictions. There's kind of a reason those things haven't taken off. There's fantastic examples of them, um, but they have yet to capture the imagination in the way that good, well thought through text has. Um, so while those things are all good and wonderful, I still regard the book as, and the terms I talked about earlier, as our kind of highest, most evolved form and most respective cultural object. Um, and that's good. That's great. Um, digital doesn't change that. Um, 
but it does add qualities to it, and it's those qualities that I want to talk about. Um, these, I would ask, I'd say that these could be considered not enhancements, but augmentations to the text. Um, they don't concentrate on the content, but on the way we experience and work with it. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's really key, that differential. And I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about velocity, I'm going to talk about breadth, and I'm going to talk about depth. And the first of these things is velocity. Um, these are some of my favorite books. Uh, these are Penguin Specials, which were published from the late 30s um, until I think the early 70s. Um, it was a paperback Penguin series in the UK. I'm sure there's lots and lots of equivalents of it in other countries and other formats and other publishers. But these are the ones I know. And the point about the Penguin Specials was they were, they were short books, um, cheaply produced, got out quickly on the current issues of the day. And I don't really know why they stopped. Um, I, think, I, I think I can guess that they stopped because the publishing industry itself became kind of too large to do things like this. It became too monolithic and corporate. It became slower to respond. Uh, lead times got longer and longer. Printing and distribution technologies got better but more complex. And, and stuff like this became harder to do. Um, but this stuff is speeding up again. Uh, we have this extraordinary ability to... Um, to, to access the text in far faster and far better. And so you're getting things that I'm really excited about happening now, like this. And again, there's many examples, but this is one of my favorite. This is the Brain Shots imprint done by um, uh, Dan uh, at Random House in London. Um, uh, it's a, a series of digital-only shorts produced for Kindle singles. Um, in particular, he did a series this summer called uh, Summer of Unrest, uh, which was four or five short titles written uh, largely sourced from bloggers, but producing original content in response to, uh, in fact, in response to the student protests we had in the UK last year, in kind of November, December. Um, but the speed of turnaround and the understanding of this, what was happening in society at the time allowed him to get these books out in June or July, kind of around the time of the London riots. Um, they're incredibly relevant texts that could only be produced uh, through this digital means. But they are still texts. And the difference that happened is the speed of the response and it, in the understanding of the market that was available for this stuff uh, and, uh, and the ways in which you could get it out to people at the speed it needs to be got out to be relevant. Uh, and that's one aspect of the, the velocity of the text that digital brings to, to what could have been very traditional texts. Um, and that comes out of a kind of deep understanding as well of reading that's only recently becoming possible with digital. Um, I've talked in the past quite a lot about something I call book guilt, um, which is uh, basically people's weird feelings about the need to finish a book is where this comes from. Um, people have, it's one thing, it's wonderful we've built the book into such a prime cultural object over centuries. Uh, it's bad because it actually terrifies a lot of people. Um, and one of the ways it terrifies them is that they feel they have to finish books and if they don't finish them, that they're bad people. Um, and this is bad because it kind of stops people reading a lot of the time. Uh, they, um, I, I know people who haven't read a book for a couple of years because they didn't finish the last one. Um, and, 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 and that makes them a bad person. They stop entirely, and it's rubbish. Um, so, um, but what, what's really interesting to me, uh, particularly with regard to the Kindle Singles stuff, is that, um, as I understand it... Um, Amazon looked at statistics and the way people were reading, and they saw that people weren't finishing books. And so the obvious result is to make shorter books. Um, it's one, one absolute definite approach to it, and it's a way in which the velocity of the material allows us to uh, react to people's behavior uh, in, in new ways. But it's very key that it's not a new behavior, right? Um, I, there's a techno-determinist view that says new technology makes people behave in new ways around this stuff. People have always read differently than we've liked to believe, because it's always been anecdotal and people are very proud about this. The network reveals um, these, these behaviors. It, it doesn't necessarily produce them, but we can now act on them and change the way we do stuff. So after velocity is breadth, and breadth implies context. And I'm sorry to pull up more pictures of old books because it's really cheesy, but it is kind of necessary to establish that books, again, have always existed in context. They've always come with footnotes and notes. Um, They've always been shared, um, so I'll come on to the sharing bit in a minute, actually. They've always been part of a larger body of knowledge that's incredibly important, not only within the text itself, but within in the wider world, how we put them adjacent to one another and how we connect them to one another. Um, 
and even beyond the library or the bookshop, how they exist across the world in context with one another. This has always been the case. The, the books have always been networked. Uh, they've always connected to one another in ways. It just hasn't always been as obvious to us. As we are now becoming more networked, this stuff becomes increasingly obvious, and we can do things with that. Um, we can do bad things with that. I'm, uh, th this is a paper example that applies to digital as well. Um, Bad breadth is, is kind of flooding the market with more and more stuff, doing cheap ebook editions, doing cheap POD editions, which I'm seeing kind of a lot of happening at the moment. Digital only imprints that exist only to kind of cram more and more backlist stuff out there. When actually what we need to do to take account of that breadth is more editorial content. See, the sort of it's worrying to see the shades of editorial direction kind of declining with the rise of digital. And I know most people here are kind of technologists rather than editors, but it's really important that whatever side you're on, we kind of work together to make sure editorial standards take account of what digital provides to books, uh, not just uh, kind of using it to get more content out there. So I'm talking about things like really good, well-written introductions, good indexes, tables of contents, kind of boring stuff like that that's incredibly important. I mean, the introductions aren't boring. Putting books in context, what kind of really good classics presses do. Uh, is better and the kind of costs of doing that are lower um, and the connections we can make are kind of ever broader. Um, and, and, and we can make that visible, more visible now with digital to connect things better. Things that have always been connected in themselves but connecting them through us as well, I think is incredibly key. And, and you get kind of, you know, and there's, there's ways that this can be kind of helped. This is, I do this in eBooks and no one's listening yet. But um, commenting and highlighting where I find kind of, issues. this is from Neil Stevenson's Reamed, by the way, which is a terrible book, don't read it. Um, uh, no, um, I've abandoned it. Um, it's got a lot of typos in it, it's from a major press, come on. Um, uh, but that's not the reason I stopped reading anyway, but, but seriously, stuff like this. Um, this allows us to um, create kind of uh, conduits of information between readers and editors and, and, and kind of close some of those gaps in the breadth of the book to bring these kind of things around together. Um, most of these issues can be resolved through the pre proper use of digital applied to books. Um, I'm waiting for time. Um, and the final thing, the thing that I think about most of the time is, um, is depth. Um, what books, as I said, have always been social. Um, and they've been social in lots of really interesting ways. Um, this is kind of something that I wrote down on a piece of paper um, a few years ago now, and it's still extraordinarily true. Um, what it is is the realization, when I said earlier about books being separated their, from their format, books are uh, are totally separate from any kind of container, in that they exist in time as well as in space. Uh, it's their really signal quality. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing about them. Um, they, are, they are noumenal, sort of notional objects in and of themselves, regardless of how they're presented to us. Uh, this is an example of one possible kind of timeline of the book, of just a printed book, of that before it's bought in its shiny cover in the bookshop, it's not a book as we like to think about it, it's an advert, it's an advert for itself. Um, and then there's this period in the middle when it's actually being read and interacted with. Um, and, and there's something going on that until recently we knew very little about. But now because people are reading electronically, we're starting to delve into what was once a black hole of understanding and really kind of coming to grips with this stuff. And then after we've finished it, it becomes something else. It becomes this souvenir of itself, of the experience that it engendered. Um, and that's an incredibly powerful thing as well. And, You'll notice if you start looking into electronic reading, and you've probably already noticed, um, people's kind of grappling with this stuff and, and trying to understand how this works. And for a long time, there was a lot of, I mentioned this a bit yesterday, a lot, there was a lot of resistance to ebooks, there still is. Um, but that, that resistance always to me seemed to be focused on the, the physical qualities of the book. Uh, that people were kind of like, oh, but I really like the paper and I like the smell and all that kind of stuff. And that, that was what people talked about. And I don't think that's important at all, and I think there was a misunderstanding, but there was a kind of cognitive, what does that mean? Three minutes, right. Something going on, cognitive dissonance, um, that meant people didn't really understand why they disliked um, these things so much. And it's because the book didn't fulfill these qualities. What the book does do, uh, what, what, what we keep trying to do is create these records of electronic reading experiences. These are the books I read on Flickr because I want some digital record of what I've done because it's important to me. Um, because this is what we're kind of going to be left with from electronic books. It's our record from social reading. 
right? This is what social reading enables. It's not just commenting and it's not just highlighting. It's not just putting um, more stuff into the book. It's putting stuff around it that means something to us. Um, I won't own the books for much longer. I will no longer own most of the books that I read, not properly. But what I own is my experience of them. And I want to be able to save that because it's the most important part of my reading. And I want to be able to pass that on to other people. I want teachers to be able to give it to their students. I want maybe instead of passing a library on to my kids, to be able to pass on my experience of the books so that they can see the things I read and how them. And that's why things like this are important. Um, this is the open bookmarks message as encoded by Last.fm, which is a music data service. Uh, if it doesn't scrobble, it doesn't count. Um, all our social data services, all our social reading services must produce this data because that is kind of what books are becoming now and how we shall own them and how they'll belong to us. Um, those are the three qualities, I think. Um, this is faster, higher, stronger, but I mean velocity, breadth, and depth. The, the three things that digital adds to books, things that books have always had, but digital can kind of increase and augment in new and exciting ways. I was going to talk to you about a few more books, um, but I'm aware I'm running out of time. Um, I want to talk very quickly about this very, very quickly. These are 50 copies of Hard Times. This is an exhibition in uh, Eindhoven at the moment. These are 50 books that I made. Um, they look like this. They look like cheap paperback copies of Hard Times. Um, the reason I did this is because I messed with the contents of each one. Each one, each 50 copy, contains a different version of the text of Hard Times. I thought I was being really clever. I thought I was making some kind of comment on piracy and the way text changes in time. I still think I am. I think there's valid comments in there. I think the way in which we're currently digitizing books is changing the very nature of them. But not enough, not enough. Even, even when, you, when you swap words in and out of the text, like I did, um, even when you run it through a translator into Spanish, um, this is Google Translate, which is awful, awful for books, it, even more visibly awful when you then translate it back into English again. Um, and it becomes, the, the whole text is there. You get this incredible brain freeze, because it's like it should be English, but it's kind of spam comment English, and it freezes your brain up and it disturbs it. And I know you want to see this version as well. Um, so what I, what I was doing here was trying to under, do a project that tried to understand digitization and the way books change when they become digital. Um, and, and messing with the text to kind of produce these effects. Um, what I realized on doing it is what I've been trying to say beforehand is that you can't break the text. Uh, the text is, however much we do to it, the text stands for itself. Uh, it's kind of, it's somewhat inviolable. Um, all we can do to it is create things around it that enhance our own experience of it, because our own experience of it um, are the most important. Um, do experiments, do strange things, um, but look for what technology can, can give to the book, not how it can change it or break it apart. Um, thank you, that'll do. Cheers. <laughs>